let's start with a big question for all people, you and I in particular, and many colleagues that we know, right, have been working around education reform. People have been talking about it for years, decades. And why why are we still here? Why do this why do achievement gaps still persist? Why do they occur? What what do we need to do differently? I think there are uh, a couple of, of answers to that. The, and the first one, which is probably the most important thing, is that if, if you're a person who's like us, right, so you believe that schools have um, an incredibly important role in helping to create like a freer and better society, and that education is like a pillar upon which, you know, like that society rests, you know, um, then you're going to go all in on um, uh, on radically changing interactions with that institution, you know. Uh, and I think that's what we've been trying to do for a long time. We we tried to change the way you measure success. We've tried to change the way people access greatness, right? Or 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 are not uh, sort of forcefully directed to schools that don't meet their needs, right? Or don't don't uh, uh, don't help kids become the best version of themselves, you know, whatever. And I think what we got wrong was the um, how much inertia there is to not do any of those things. Um, and uh, this is the best and worst thing about creating institutions with inertia, right? It's that like, you don't have to push on them all the time to get them to move, but they can keep moving in a direction you don't want them to without you. You know, and uh, the like the the weight of American traditional public education, like how kids are assigned, how the money is raised and distributed, who gets what teacher, um, what level of underperformance is acceptable versus uh, you know what level of success is aspired to. Um, all of those, all of those qualities are wired into the traditional system in ways that I think well-meaning, reform-minded people just wildly underestimate. It. Like, yes. uh, you know, if you say to somebody, "Okay, I got this great solution," but guess what? It means the value of your house is going to go down twenty percent because <laughs> like your house with your school, like they're not going to be, they're not going to be able to move for that. Like, it, it, it just doesn't yeah. make sense. There. There's been, um, you know, like. It took 25 years to wake up to the fact that, you know, guess what? Like people are going to be self-interested because people are self-interested. I don't say that in a pejorative way. It just kind of is what it is. Um, I think we've done some really great stuff. Um, I think we could have done a lot more of it potentially if we um, just accepted that at the at the beginning. Uh, but now we kind of we kind of are where we are. And I think the big question is like now that we know those things, right? Now that you you have um, you can diagram out where all the friction is, like in exquisite detail, like well, what are we gonna do about it? And maybe that's the next set of questions for the next you know, 10 years of reform, <laughs> whatever you wanna call it. But. Yeah, well then, I mean, say that, talk more about that, right? When you think about some of those exquisite, de exquisitely detailed areas of friction, where are the ones where you're paying the most attention or you see the most possibility? Yeah, so um, just as a social matter, I think there's a lot of interest, though it's not really deep interest, in the long-term effects of redlining and how that um, has sort of fledged the current system and in a lot of respects um, intertwined race in the delivery of the current system in a way that um, no person who believes in markets and freedom and no person who um, believes in equality, right, should should be able to get behind. I mean, we just sort of, we just closed down, but I, I chair the board of this organization called Ed Build. And one of the things, you know, we do, the, the smart people who work there, smarter than the board chair of the organization, um, <laughs> is, is, is analyze school district, you know, school district boundaries and, and finance, you know, and you couldn't, you couldn't design a less equitable system than by um, using jury, like uh, uh, school assignment zones and and layering them on housing zones to ensure that people will not be able to move and will go to specific schools, and then purposely depressing the property value in one place 
and allowing it to rise in, a, in another um, and, and, be, and, and, uh, and making property taxes like the primary means to fund schools, right? Like if, if, yeah. you, if, you, like if you did that, you want like a deeply inequitable system that is divided by resources and race, right? Um, you know, it, or, or one day you wake up and you're like, oh yeah, I guess that's what we want. You know? <laughs> um, and so I think there is a lot of, uh, of interest around that. What concerns me is that uh, people are approaching this question of how to solve that by saying we should just equalize the money, um, which, is, which is completely insufficient. Um, it, like, yes, you know, property tax is maybe the most stable way to fund schools. You know, collecting them and distributing them better, right? Or changing taxing, taxing jurisdi jurisdictions, really good, but a half measure. Until you get a residential assignment, you, you haven't really untangled that whole thing. And just with, you know, obviously all the talk about racial injustice in the country right now, yeah. like this is a long-standing, deeply entrenched, like clearly obvious uh, manifestation of that. I think there's some, some appetite to take that on now. It's interesting how that's palpably changed, I think, in, in, in strange, it's sort of not strange ways, but it's like, it's, a, it's un, un, it's unusual that it's such a palpable change all of a sudden this summer, which is a lot's happening in the world. But I, I always think about how this is a platitude, but it's true, right? Every system is perfectly designed for the results it's getting. So it should shock none of us that these deep inequities exist and they're not random. It's not random, right? Yeah. There's nothing random about it. And I think the um, as people are understanding better idea, like the history, it might've been decades ago when there was redlining or mortgage policy made or how, like all the things that have built over time um, to end up where we are. So culture is all the decisions that were made before you got here. <laughs> I think it's really important to, like, even when we talk about these things, right? Like, I don't, I'm not going to make, I'm not, I'm not going to say that because you played by the rules, right? Like you're born, all of these systems are set up, right? You, you buy your house because your school is bundled with it, right? And you go and you do what we've asked you to do, right? Um, I do think that like, you know, people play by the rules and a lot of the time the rules get built before they get, get here, right? And so um, it's always, whenever we talk about big change like this, I think it's always important to help people reconcile the fact that you you may be a part of it even if you didn't create it um and that would, i don't necessarily blame you for that like what what i blame you for is once the the last act plays out and you realize you know the enemy is us like well then you have a responsibility to kind of do something about it you know it's like you, know, you mean you mean i was the villain um, and so uh, I think we're just at this at a moment now where it's like, all right, fine, you know, all, all this, like you might not have organized all this, but you have a constructive role in helping to fix it. Let, let's see what happens. I think that is a, a, a really important a nuance um, in a way that is, uh, it's sort of generous and that, I mean, it's, it, it's generous, right? Because it helps people sort of find their way back in, to be honest. Girl, when I think a lot of people are like, what to, like, sort of frozen because, you're like, holy cow, I am, I'm part of this. I'm part of this. And if I move too quickly, someone might see me, you know, like, what do I, what do I, what do I do? This, so is, I think always, that's a, this is always hipster, cool guy, Arthur Brooks's thing, where it's like, you can't, you know, that guy, he dresses really well. It's annoying. Um, <laughs> you can't, you know, you can't lead with contempt, right? Like the, 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 you know, the, the taxonomy of the pitch matters, right? And if you start, with a place of like incredible guilt and blame, like you might get something short term from somebody, but you won't get the long term buy in that you need to make the kind of like big change that I think we're talking about if you want a much better society. And that happens across lots of things. And like education is so personal, right? It, it obviously yeah. happens. Yeah. And we're all, it's such an interest. It's, it's interesting because, right, all of us have our own slice of expertise because we were students, right? And had whatever that experience was, however many moons ago it was. And or parents or no children, you know, there's, there's, there's we're all have our, bring our expertise. But let's talk a little bit about education is this bizarre mix in some ways of governance, 
right? And 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 money and the public good and equity and and how this comes together results in what we've got for the good or for the bad. And what like when you think about how to improve those guidelines about how we organize public education, what what are you what what, what do you want to see? What do you want to see? So I'm going to start with something unpopular. And before I say before I say the unpopular thing, I would I would like to lean on a literary analogy that will mean nothing to you. So um, Ursula K. Le Guin wrote this book called A Wizard of Earthsea. Um, and Earthsea is this like, uh, have you read this? You know this book? Or? No, but I'm like, oh, Darrell's giving us a sci-fi reference. I'm just no, I did it. called it and I'm thrilled. Not be surprised. Um, and, uh, and in it, the protagonist lives in a world where, where magic is about naming things, right? And so you have to, you have to know the true name of a thing to, to control it, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that's really important because the, the underlying nature of things, like understanding them in, in government, in the private sector or whatever is really important to improving them or changing them. And so my kind of opening uh, gambit on this is that most people think public education is a right, and it isn't. It's a good. Um, and as long, and the reason why it's a good, like one thing is really good thing, is that it is the most personal thing you can have. And once you get it, nobody can take it away from you. So like to be well-educated is to, is to own a version of yourself that no one can take away. And, and that, that's a good to me. Um, the other one is that as long as it is bought and access is bought and sold through the mortgage market, it's a good. Um, and uh, so, like, it's important to understand that we have a, a good that is masquerading as a, as a right. Um, and if you know that, you will behave differently, right? So, so I just want to name that. I think that's, um, that's sort of essential. Um, the other couple of things. So I think it's just important to realize the, uh, you know, you, like, if you know anybody with more than one kid and you're like, you know, you know that one day you look at one of them and you think you're like, that's mine. And you look at the other one and you're like, I don't know where you came from. Right. Or you're like, <laughs> you, know, you must be your father's son or something like that. because You couldn't belong to me, you know. Um, and so that's the, the best thing about, you know, humanity is that like we're all different. Um, and what I think has been revealed over time is that uh, different kinds of school governance, right, independent school governance, um, char like charter boards or independent or, or authorizers, um, school districts uh, a as a mode of governance are all good at doing different things. And the way that they hold themselves accountable helps you figure out what they're going to be good at doing. So the, the mix of choice and, and, and sort of independent, like, you know, non-secular governance gives you, you know, I don't know, Our Lady of Lords, right? Or, or, or it gives you the St. Paul School for Boys where I went to school, right? Um, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, choice, high regulation governance in the Northeast, right? With, with an, a guiding ethos of like, we're gonna close achievement gaps, gives you Success Academy, right? Or Achievement First or IDEA or, or, or like a network that is really, for that, that is producing incredible gains for low-income kids of color, right? Um, districts, uh, uh, overall, I would say they do magnets really well, right? They, they, which, is, which is to say they do selectivity really well. Um, they educate like high-income kids pretty well, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and they have the capacity to do a lot for special needs kids, right? Because it's facilities, it's bonding. Yeah whatever, whatever. Um, and then everything else is kind of like it's you know you you're kind of rolling the dice you know um, and so I don't think I'm, I don't think any of that is negative unless you want a monopoly on creating schools right um, if you have a more diverse approach like every other part of our you know our, our universe right like civil civil society is engaged or private society is engaged all these other people are, are, are engaged you're more likely to create the variety of things that people of variety need to be successful. Um, and I, I think that's like a fundamental challenge of the last like 15, 20 years of, you yeah. know, 
charter schools or or weighted student formulas or or you know like do you want to do tax credits or or you know uh, how about virtual hybrid you know what's what's up with your pod you know like how about the micro schools right i mean, I mean this is all the the maybe the latest uh, iterations of, of all that stuff so um so uh, maybe to, to not answer your your opening question well <laughs> <laughs> is that um, you know it's it, like uh i value different modes of governance because they give us different good things um i do not think that any one mode of school governance um is is the answer for all people because no one mode of anything is the answer uh, for all people yeah um, and that the approach for a diverse nation should be a diverse one um and the, the place where you know we can probably intervene most quickly is in diversity of school there's a lot of a lot of discussion around choice charters magnets just what you were describing and supporting investing in our public systems and um, not to be too obvious, but talk, the work you do, you focus a lot about choice and autonomy and agency for kids. Why is that so essential if we're talking about increasing opportunity? Yeah, it's the choice is interesting because like discipline, it is both a policy and a value. And so mm -hmm. what matters more to you uh, informs what you will support. So that for some people, the choice is only good if it's a choice of something better. Um, and if you believe that, right, and which is to say your uh, internal bent is a more rational one about improving educational opportunity, right, um, then you will have a specific policy approach that's probably like, you know, uh, like targeted, low income, high regulation, very objective measures of success, right? Um, in the other direction, there, there are people who believe that um, the right to self-determination is so fundamental that it obviates all other concerns. <laughs> and so, uh, you, and if you feel that way, you might, you, might, you might be inclined to be like, if a parent thinks it's best, we should just let them go with it, right? Um, and, you know, for me, I've sort of historically been someplace in the middle. Right. Like, like I, I very much think the results matter, but, uh, you know, for a person who grows up in a place where you don't have a lot of choice, the ability to choose, right. Is about enabling aspects of the, like the human condition, right. That, um, that are essential. Um, and, and frankly, that undergird our entire democracy, you know? Um, and so, uh, part of what I've, I've, try to do it and, and I should just sort of like, you know, put my cards on the table here. So, you know, I grew up in, in this neighborhood in Southwest Baltimore that um, most people know not because I grew up there, but because many years later, uh, a, a black boy named Freddie Gray died there and the city burned as a result, you know, um, and uh, it is not fun to see your hometown on fire on the six o'clock news. Um, and the the you know none of the schools i went to were except for the first one were schools i was zoned to is that i had an aunt and she taught in the baltimore city public school system and she like gained it in every like i got tested in ways i never should have been tested i had all kinds of leverage like one of my earliest memories is my mother and my grandmother sitting at the kitchen table talking about whose address we were going to use so i could go to the school i wasn't zoned for right so so this is the, the way that um lots of people experience public education in, in America. Um, and I finished at an independent K-12, you know, boys day school, uh, you know, Catholic, it was Episcopalian. That's when I learned the difference between like debtors and trespassers. I was like, why do they say debtors? <laughs> um, and now, you know, that was the most- That's all get different. Yeah, it's yeah. all different, it's all different. You watch the tutors, you learn more. Um, but the, uh, that was, um, you know, like going to that school, uh, changed my life. I mean, in 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 pr profound ways. Like, I, I mean, you know, I'm a black kid from this place. I go, you know, I wind up in the Ivy League. I get to talk to you about this stuff, you know. Um, and so the the um, the agency piece of that is really important. Yeah. Lots of people who who believe options are essential to helping people, you know, get into schools to become the best versions of themselves. And like beneath it all, that has always been my reason 
for advocating for more choice for, for parents and families and, and, and ultimately for kids because I, you know, there, there is no one size fits all. Um, I think there's something tragic about the, the unknowing of who you could be because you were never in a position to learn who you could have been. Um, and schools are such a vital and essential, you know, piece of the, the continuum of you trying to become who you should be that you can't ignore what happens when a school is not well positioned to help you do that. And if there's a place right down the street or around the corner, whatever they can, like, I think, you know, we need to help people get there. Yes, right. I mean, that's, it's so obvious that human capacity is equally distributed, right? Right. Like that is, there's no, like, yeah. that sort of unlocking of people and unlocking of potential matters to all of us who live together in this planet and our country, right? Like it just doesn't, there's no, doesn't matter if you're a humanist, if you're just, right? Like it doesn't, like how you come at this, it's it's really clear. I think that's what has been always behind when President Bush would talk about the, the soft bigotry of low expectations and really what was around the idea of accountability when he was governor and as president. And we know that there's a lot that No Child Left Behind did in terms of trying to surface whether or not schools we're, we're serving kids, like we're, which kids are being served and which kids weren't, and what do we know about that? It wasn't a perfect tool, obviously, uh, as, a, as time has gone by in terms of it, people have, you know, the role, how, the role of tests, how that changed the way schools operate, what got gamed, what didn't. But when you think about policy that could support what you're just describing, right, like the experience you happen to have, a few people who knew enough to keep gaming and moving to give to make sure like you had opportunity. I always think about that. I was I went to a suburban fine school district in the Midwest and thought it was fine. My parents are teachers. I went to a highly selective college and I was really good at worksheets and I was terrible at sitting in a lecture and I was panicked. I was panicked and I was thinking, where did kids learn how to do this? I'm a white girl from Minnesota. Like I don't there's so much I don't know. And it was it, like it revealed the matrix to me of like, oh, oh, all things are not equal. And this is, this is crazy, right? So when you think about policy that gives you hope, if a if policy can do that, what, it, what does it look like to you? I, I grew up in education policy, like as, a, as an expat from the publishing industry um, during the implementation of No Child Left Behind. And so my view on success, failure, intervention, everything um, is catalyzed by that statement of attacking the soft bigotry of low expectations. Like I, I had never heard anything that so clearly seemed to get at the, the haze around the education of black kids in particular that made success difficult to see. Um, and so I just, uh, you know, like, like every set of policies, they, they are produced, they have an effect, and then there's a, there's a gap between when the effect hits and when you can actually appreciate them. And in the last 50 years, I don't know, other than actually, you know, more than 50 years, other than actually passing, you know, IDEA or, or the, uh, um, um, the, for ESEA, you know, uh, I, I think, you know, Child Left Behind is the most important education policy of the last, you know, 60 years, right? Uh, and, and lots of other things flow from that. Like, you don't, you can't make, make the case for charter schools without data, right? You can't, right. Um, you know, uh, SES, uh, the like sub, sub services tutoring, that was the first taste of, of, of having an option that lots of parents and families had. Like the, these things were fundamental and they could not be easily unstuck. So, I, so you know, I don't know if you're going to see the president anytime, but thank you. <laughs> um, we will pass it along yeah, uh, the, the two uh, so I think three things um, one is about measurement uh, ironically because what um, the, the public mind has changed on standardized testing uh, and though it remains important to me if we can't marshal cultural or political buy-in around it then the question is, how do we keep it while giving a more nuanced view of, of what the world is? Because like allegedly people want a more nuanced view. And so um, uh, 
systems of measurement that do not throw away the objectivity that matters so much to measuring to you know quantifying student success and which is also very like standardized assessments matter a lot to parents of color right they they like this data uh in in you know covid um rolling up the uh end of year assessments like lots of parents in our network have been like i need to know like like when are we going to find out are we going to have an assessment at the start of school so so again like different people view these things differently i think that's important um but a, a way to measure progress that doesn't throw away objectivity um while not having so many variables that everything is meaningless i think really matters yeah. uh, that would be one thing uh the second thing is very specifically on on charter schools um it's not exclusive to charter schools but i feel like private schools do do this better and, and districts for some of the reasons we talked about earlier have a hard time doing it um the we we in the education policy world uh have a sense of what we think works um and that very well described sense of what those things are have also narrowed what is produced by the process of charter authorizing so we have uh, lots of schools that are really good at a couple things they work really well for very specific groups of kids but unlike their district school counterparts they are not diverse enough in terms of offering or location or constituency to long-term protect themselves right or, or to long-term actually maximize what chartering could do for more people um so this more like diverse or open approach i think is really important and then the last thing is like it you know it's money so as as long as the you know the loop of local property tax local governance like locally delivered right to schools not like you know sort of actually to districts regardless of where kids are in schools you know i, I think yeah. you'll probably recall was the the hidden gaps i think is what the study was of many years ago that showed like yeah. you know the the flux the variance and per pupil between schools in a district linked to teacher salaries right like that's you know that 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 is particularly pernicious if you're a low-income kid you know um so those sort of right. nuances about like what you can buy and where you can go like you know i it, i i like you know as the education savings account idea it's specifically right now like if you're you know if you can curate something that's going to keep your kid occupied and and it you know if you buy this online thing and there's a local tutor who's gotten strong antibodies and they can show up and do something for you you know like i, I think we should we should foster that so it's uh you know, yeah, it's the measurement, d diversity, uh, sort of creativity, and then um, uh, finance or, or flexibility around finance. Well, the work that you do um, at 50 Can, you 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 work with a lot of families, right? Who are tell tell us like talk about what your families are asking for, what the questions they have, what are the what are the things that are the biggest kind of ahas to them about how the system works and what what you learn from the families that you work with around the country? Yeah, so it's kind of, it's a little bit of like a um, it's a little torturous, but there's like a, a game that I have sometimes where I'm like, all right, design the perfect system. Yeah. And then they come back and I'm like, OK, now here are all the reasons why you can't do any of that, those things. <laughs> and they're like, what do you mean? It's like, well, let's talk about it. Welcome to advocacy. Yeah. You know? right. Um, and so w one of the things I, I mean, re remember the problems of parents are unique to their children, right? And there is an, evol an evolution that has to go on about, you know, political knowledge and policy knowledge, whatever that gets um, a parent who is an advocate for their child to be uh, an advocate for all children, right? In a way that that is about improving systems or options or whatever. And I just want to say that like, I'm sure you know plenty of fellowship junkies. Um, one of the things that expresses itself across our programming and across our states is that parents are are hungry for the same thing, right? They want to know more. They want their you know their lives, their knowledge, their ability to make change in, enriched in a in, in the same way that everybody else does, right? So so that's uh, and I think that's actually essential because like good advocacy isn't me telling you what to be excited about is you being excited about what i'm excited about when i'm not there right and that that transfer of ownership and information and power is really critical and so so that's a that's a thing. um i think lots of our families have been um 
disappointed by what they have seen as um, like a race to the bottom in, in, yeah. uh, in some districts that's been catalyzed by COVID, right? Um, yeah. The, you know, the talk of no assessments in the fall, you know, like uh, our parents in Georgia were like, we gave you the spring, the fall is too much. Right? Like their words, not mine, you know? Um, and uh, and, and they, they care about this, you know? Um, some, uh, some of our families have been concerned about what they believe is the like lowered expectations for their kids. So they, you know, the kids were, you know, getting A's, they got worksheets during the shutdown. They were, the kids were killing the worksheets in like two minutes. And they're like, what does my kid do all day if they're, if they're on this, right? So there's been like a real revelation about, about that, which I think is important. Yeah. Um, you know, this isn't sort of a, a parent thing, but across like our network staff, we were sort of like very disappointed with the um, Seattle and San Francisco's, just give everybody an A. Um, because from an equity standpoint, that will have exactly the opposite effect. Like everybody's gonna be like, oh yeah, the, the white kid's A is an A. The, the black kid's A, of course, is not an A, right? You just, you just cement exactly what you thought you were right. getting rid of. And, and that to me also showed the, the worst instincts of school districts in a way that is not helpful. Um, you know, which is like without the constant monitoring that you said you did not need, you will do this, right? Which, which is, which is just fall to the very bottom and call it you know, equity. Um, and, uh, and, and our, our families and us, we've all been very concerned about, about those things. Obviously everything in the world is, is upside down right now with the pandemic. Um, but the impact on schools are, is, it's almost hard to like actually wrap your mind around how many ways this is impacting the normal way of school. And I'm, I know some of this over time will surface innovation and things that will stick that are better for kids, but there's a huge amount of risk. There's a huge amount of risk, some of which you've touched on um, so far. So what are you, what are you paying attention to? What are your parents, your, their, your colleagues, what are you all paying attention to, especially as we move into and through this coming school year? Yeah, so uh, great question. Um, so two, two or three things on this. The, the first one, and I was, I was a little bit like the skunk at the garden party on this in, in, the, in the spring when, uh, when everybody was like, you know, we need to keep kids back in school, right? When, when, when purely the return to school became the goal. Um, right. And, uh, and I'd, you know, I'd be saying to people, you know, in 2019, 18% of black fourth graders in this country tested proficient or above on the NAEP. And that's what you want to run back to, right? So it, it's really important to remember, like regardless of all the issues that have emerged, the place to which we want to return was a place we spent a quarter of a century trying to give people alternatives to, you know? And yeah. like, I don't, I don't want to be punitive about it, but, but that's just <laughs> real. So I'm keeping yeah. it you know, that, that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is that, um, again, like, you know, my region of the country, I'm, I'm uh, a recovering Manhattanite, but I, you know, I live just outside of New York right now. Like, we've been, we've been very hard hit. Uh, lots of families have been hard hit. Lots of kids have lost older relatives. Like, this, this is real for, for us. Yeah. Right? And so um, one of the most important things about governments is that they can change behavior. And in our region of the country, people are scared of the coronavirus, right? Uh, because, you know, months of weekly press conferences, like lockdowns and, and all this other stuff, like it does have an effect on people, you know? And so the second thing I think we were watching, it, watching is just the, the sentiment between um, teachers and what they want to do and parents and families and what they want to do. And the, because there are legitimate risks and issues on both sides and the discussion has to embrace both sides so for instance i'm highly sympathetic to teachers desire to return to um, uh, uh, the workplace safely at the same time the some of the things we're seeing like you know three times a week COVID testing that, that that's like in a, in a draft document up here that can, that no, we can't do that for anybody right now so like if uh condition of reopening is that you're not serious about reopening 
right? You, 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 just put, you just put a marker down that will not be reached realistically. So you don't right. really want to reach it, you know? Um, and that, that sort of posturing actually undermines the legitimate health concerns of teachers, I think, because it's unrealistic and obviously political. And, um, and in particular, it does a disservice to the 20% of administrators and 18% of teachers who are like 50 and above and in the, the highly susceptible yeah. category. Yeah. Um, the second thing too is like, um, parents are gonna wanna go back to work. Um, and, and again, like just to assert this, like I'm not arguing for reopening, right? I, I, I actually think that um, it's too soon, at least up here. Um, and lots of my friends don't think that, but I, I think that. Um, and that uh, uh, if you believe that, then we should be trying to optimize other things, right? But, but yeah. into the mix are the fact that like low-income families want to go back to work, need to go back to work, right? We, we do not know if there will be some wholesale extension of, of you know, enhanced unemployment insurance benefits or whatever. And so the option will be, my school does not want to open at all. Um, and I have to go to work so I can feed the kid who would be at school. Um, and that is a legitimate public policy concern that is not in the discussion right now, right? So like, let's right. talk about families and their desire to, to go back to work because that matters. This is an economy over, over epidemiology. It is the fact, it's like economic concerns are real concerns. So I think that's maybe the second thing. The third thing um, that we're watching, and I've been very frustrated about this, is that I'm not, I'm not a distance learning advocate, but when the economy is shut down and schools are shut down, the only way you're going to teach people is online. And so for me in the spring, what we should have been focused on, what everybody should have been focused on was doing the best we can with virtual, like highlighting the networks that are doing, like, I think we should have policies that open, that open enroll the nation at this point. So if you are a great charter network or yeah. private school network or district, like you should be able to take kids from any place in America at this point, because like, if you figure it out, we, we need you. You can, as many kids can go there, should be able to go there, you know? Instead, like, on the one hand, there were people who do what we do. They're ed reform people. And they were like, you know, scared of, of you know, distance learning as like a disruptive force. And so they were like, well, it's bad. And everybody went out and attacked it, attacked it, right? Even though it was the only tool we had to educate yeah. kids in a, in a universe where they can't go to school. That was the first thing. The second thing is that, um, and I don't blame teachers for this, but I'm, I absolutely blame the unions for it. Um, what started as what I believe was serious pro-teacher advocacy, like in, in New York, de Blasio wanted to open schools on Friday, and I was like, that's nuts. And then the unions, the teachers union pushed back on Amico for many reasons yeah. that Monday. That was good, you know? But some of the work, work rules that are coming out, like in LA, you know, four hours a day, um, uh, be, online is optional. Like the, the teacher doesn't even have to have to show up. This, this would be like us doing this interview and me sending you a transcript, right? With, without right. us doing it. I'm mean, like, here's what I want to say. You know? Yeah. Uh, so they deliberately work to make teachers scarce, right? And, yeah. and that is going to hurt the delivery of virtual. And now all the people who did that, who organized that, who basically sabotaged the one tool we had in the spring are like, we're not reopening, we're going virtual. And uh, if I had like, I don't know, if I like, if I was a cartoon me, there would be like smoke coming out of my ears. Because, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a hard discussion to have. Like on the one hand, you're like, look, I'm all down yeah. for public health stuff. On the other hand, you have done everything possible to make this not work. And now the kids have the worst of both worlds, right? And, uh, yeah. and, and so the, those, are, those are the things that we're, that we're looking at. And I, I think, you know, really, unfortunately, where are you going to see people say, I'm out, this is too much for me, is going to be higher income folks who are yep. mortgaged to death to get school that won't be given to them now. And they're like, I'm not having it because that's the way it works, you know? And, uh, you know, uh, pods and, you know, right. small group tutors and all that. I, I, I think you see a, a real rise in homeschooling and, uh, and all those other things, not just because of the childcare implications, right? But because yeah. People have had, you know, like a few months to see what the default delivery in this mode from school districts is, and they're unimpressed.
And I also think, right, like the, the, I have an incoming kindergartner. It has not been a pleasant. Is it somebody right? else's kindergartner? No. <laughs> <laughs> Mine. Mine. <laughs> and he, and, but I live in a place, right, where I'm like, okay, this is, this is a nightmare and it's difficult, but I have lots of agency, right? I have, I can, we can, it, it won't be perfect, but I have some ways to cobble this together. I happen to work for an organization that knows they have working parents, right, right. that are, like are doing everything they can to help us do our jobs and and raise our kids and you know all those kinds of things right and all the time i'm thinking about so many people who have none of that but have those kids right and who who is going to be continue to be disproportionately impacted and i'm seeing a lot of folks rightfully you know because we are as you said when we started self interested right we all have to take care of our own selves and our own families and are thinking about that but the experience that that I'm having or the people that we know have who have some knowledge and agency and resources is so vastly different than so many families. And it's black families, Latinx families, students in poverty. Like they, I, we, I, it, that's the part when I think about risk and I think about what, who, who really is still being left behind and how, how, how this pandemic will exacerbate that and what those of us, but who are like, ah, what, 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 what do we do? What are our opportunities to support? I mean, like, uh, you know, COVID did what President Bush did with NCLB, right? It showed a spotlight on inequities that are, are extremely loud if you are incredibly close to them, but that just have the, the low drone of sort of like unease, but you can forget it if you're not. And now yeah. all of that is just like, right out there right right in everybody's face or at for everyone to see uh and, you know everything stripped back and and to your point and it's been uh you know it, it is important that like every day i wake up i feel lucky to wake up right like i i i know how lucky i am right and and then i feel upset and sad um about the fact that uh for myriad reasons and there are lots of lots of solutions being offered to try to um, do this um, you know, we have we have a society that is unequal, and schools present that in in just the starkest ways around the most important thing, which is our kids who are our future. You know, um, and it yeah. is a, it's a super super high stakes uh, you know moment, and I'm I'm sort of frustrated to see so much politics being played with it. Let me ask you one last thing, um, and this will be your chance to. Anything else you want to? share that we haven't quite gotten to, but what do you wish more people understood about this connection between education and opportunity and why it matters so much? So there's a Seth Godin uh, uh, blog post or whatever, and there's a, a picture of two goldfish in a bowl. And one goldfish says to the other one, you mean there's water? <laughs> um, and I'll... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going somewhere with this. <laughs> um, the, the only reason why I highlight that is that, um, you know, that there is a world where you have a lot of opportunity, where it is invisible to you because you are immersed in it, right? You swim in it and it, it presents itself in the people you know and how you talk to them and the networks you have and, and, all, these, and all these other things. And in, you know, my life in particular, like, Education has been the thing that that made that possible. You know, it wasn't wasn't always um, wasn't always easy. It wasn't always fun. You know, like I, I was the you know one of like four black kids in my high school for a long time. I was the only black kid in my class for like three years. I was you know I was a poor black kid in a rich class. Like you know, there's all kinds of stuff that goes on there. You know, it's, and and it's hard, right? Um, but I wouldn't I wouldn't trade it for anything, given what the long term benefits have been. And so particularly right now, even though there are lots of other issues that I think people want to focus on, people, you know, uh, racial justice, obviously, uh, change to policing, housing policies and stuff, as we discussed, um, you know, income inequality and all these other things. I continue to think that education has its a unique role because our ability to influence the education of people is actionable and tangible. Like we can, it, it can, it happens on a schedule. Like, like if you, yeah. you, you, like if you get kid X 
in position why you can make great things happen, right? Um, that that's easier, right, or more uh, doable than wiping racism away, you know, which is like uh, which isn't easy. Right? <laughs> as, as as things have borne out, it is not it is not easy. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, so I just I just keep coming back to that, like the. If you're well educated, you're well connected, whatever, you you are in the water of opportunity in a way that makes it invisible. Um, and not everybody enjoys that. So I just keep, you know, like step back, right? Like know that not everybody has what we have. Let's let's be humble about it. Let's enjoy it. Let's also know that it ain't all us, right? <laughs> you know, it's like it's not all bootstraps. Um, and right. at the same time, you know, <laughs> I just think that like it, it, education is the thing that 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 gets you there. Uh, in, in a way that, you know, no other policy uh, re really does.